Section 15 of the Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roman Noble, RomanNoble.com. The Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories by E. F. Benson. Crank Stories. Chapter 2. Philip's Safety Razor up to the time of philip's obsession there cannot have been in all the world a happier couple than he and his wife as everybody knows the ecstasy of life has its home in the imagination and philip and phoebe partington lived almost exclusively in those realms which were illumined by the light that never was on sea or land i do not absolutely affirm that sea and land would have been the better for that light all that i insist on was that the partington effulgence certainly never was there it was a remunerative light also and out of the proceeds they bought a quantity of false elizabethan furniture and a motor-car a spin in the motor-car after the ecstatic labor of the morning cleared phoebe's head and they dined together in an elizabeth room with rushes on the floor that cleared phoebe's head too for nothing in the world could be remoter from the setting of her imaginative life than anything elizabethan she and her husband lived in an opulent and lurid present which in its turn was just as remote from contemporary life as most people know it as were the spacious days that had left their spurious traces on the dining-room they were the most industrious of artists and often had as many as three fatillions running simultaneously in provincial papers and the matter of their activity was this each morning directly after breakfast philip sat in the dining-room and until one o'clock proceeded to turn into narrative the very complete and articulated skeleton of the tale which phoebe manufactured in the drawing-room the imaginative gift was hers there was not a situation in the world which she could not contemplate unwinking like an eagle staring into the sun and these she passed on to her husband whose powers of putting them into narrative was as unrivalled as his wife's in conceiving them picture him then with his plump amiable face bent over phoebe's imaginings a perennial pipe in his mouth and invariably two or three little tufts of cotton wool stuck on to his cheek or chin where he had cut himself shaving that morning occasionally but very rarely he had to go into the drawing-room to ask the elucidation of some situation how for instance was algernon montmorency to leap lightly out of the window and so regain his motor-car when phoebe laid the scene in the top room of the moated tower of eagle's castle but phoebe would always suggest a remedy which cost the minimum readjustment and ten minutes afterwards algernon would be thundering along the road with the lurid semantic money-lender in close pursuit but for such occasional interruption and the periodic lightning of his pipe he would not pause for a second till the morning's work was over he never hesitated for a word for he had at his command the entire vocabulary of english clichés and he often got through two installments before lunch at one precisely the parlour-maid came in and groping through the fog of tobacco smoke opened all the windows and began to lay the table upon which philip washed off his tufts of cotton wool snatched phoebe from her imaginative visions and strolled in the garden with her till the gong summoned them to the recuperative spell of a mutton-chop and a glass of blood-making australian burgundy after lunch they drove in the motor-car returning for tea and from tea till dinner they read over aloud and discussed their morning's work in this way philip made acquaintance with the subject matter he would be employed on next morning and phoebe learned how that which she had written yesterday had turned out philip had never had any criticism to make his wife's imagination seemed to him one of the most glorious instruments ever devised for the delectation of the literary and she often said that of all contemporary novelists her husband was the only man capable of handling the situations she poured out in this unending flood after dinner they played patience went early to bed and awoke with an unquenchable zest for the labor and rewards of another day it is impossible to figure a happier or more harmonious existence in imagination they roamed over the entire world without the expense or inconvenience of foreign travel their spirits ranged through the whole gamut of human emotion and whatever adversities the algernon and eva of the moment went through their creators and interpreters knew in their heart of hearts that all was going to end well for otherwise they would speedily have lost their pinnacled eminence as writers of serial stories in the daily press it is true that philip's voice often shook as he read and that phoebe's eyes were dim as she listened to the written tale of the remarkable disasters and misunderstandings through which the children of her brain had to pass these are but luxurious and sterile sorrows 
in fact the greatest trial that ever came to them during these halcyon years was when the editor of one of the papers in which the tale was running wrote to say that it was so popular that he insisted on having at least another fortnight of it instead of bringing it to an end in two more installments that entailed a vast deal of work for phoebe had to search the file to find out by what constructive carpentering she could engineer an episode that would be of the requisite length when the sever were reunited must naturally be left for the end but she never failed to manage it somehow and even when tribulation was great and for the moment she could not conceive how to spin the story out her cloud had a silver lining for all this difficult work was due to the story's amazing popularity or sometimes some ill-mannered reader would write to the newspaper office to point out that st peter's church at rome did not stand on a commanding eminence or ask more information about the glittering spires on the acropolis at athens or demur to the placid waters of the nile in flood as it rolled down in blue cataracts studded with milk-white foam but otherwise their life flows on in an unbroken succession of literary triumphs and domestic happiness then suddenly without any warning whatever the curtain was rung up on a psychological tragedy of philip by some species of spiritual infection from his wife began to develop an imagination it did not at first threaten to attack what phoebe in a gallic moment had once called their vie interieure, by which she meant their literary labors but was directly concerned only with the present of a safety razor which she had made him on his birthday in order to save cotton wool and his life blood the safety razor consisted of a neat little sort of rake into which razor blades were fitted each of these when blunted by use was to be thrown away and a fresh one inserted and that morning philip finding that his blade had begun to lose its edge tossed it lightly and airily out of the dressing-room window from which it fell into a herbaceous border which ran along the house the new blade gave the utmost satisfaction and precisely at nine thirty he lit his pipe and began his work for the day on phoebe's scenario the dining-room was just below his dressing-room and at that moment there came a rustle from the herbaceous bed and phoebe's adorable persian cat leaped on to the window-sill from outside and proceeded to make its toilet in the warm may sunshine and at that precise and fatal moment philip partington's imagination began to work it stirred within him like the first faint pang of a toothache for some quarter of an hour he refused to recognize its existence and proceeded to clothe in suitable language the flight of eva up the frozen thames in an ice ship not knowing exactly what an ice ship was and being aware that his reader would be similarly ignorant he evolved a beautiful one out of his inner consciousness that skimmed along on a single runner like a skate it was not he reflected any less likely that it should keep its balance than that of a bicycle should suddenly he laid down his pen his imagination was beginning to hurt him it would be a terrible thing if phoebe's cat while it prowled through the herbaceous bed stepped on the blade of the safety razor blunt though it was for shaving purposes it would easily inflict a cruel wound on tommy's paw when his work was done he must really hunt for the blade and bestow it in some safer place he took up his pen again and wrote ever faster through the deepening winter twilight sped the ice ship and even controlling the tiller in her long tapered fingers watched the dusty banks fly past her oh god she murmured grant that i may be in time the woods of richmond the cat had finished its toilet and jumped down again into the herbaceous bed philip heard a faint mew and his awakening imagination told him that tommy had cut his foot already with a spasm of remorse he ran out into the garden and began a frenzied search for the razor blade which with such culpable carelessness he had thrown away a quarter of an hour's search was rewarded by its discovery and as there was no blood on the edge of it he thankfully assumed that he hadn't been punished nor tommy either for his thoughtlessness he unfortunately stepped on a fine calcellaria and regained the gravel path with the blade in his hand he locked it up in the drawer of his knee-hole table where he kept his will and his passbook and his checkbook and with a free mind returned to eva perilously voyaging on the ice past the woods of richmond and praying that she would be in time but suddenly and for the first time in their dual and prosperous career as feuilleton writers philip found himself finding a certain want of actuality in phoebe's imaginings they lacked the bite of such realism as he had found illustrated in the poignancy of his own search 
for the discarded razor blade in the herbaceous border. There was emotion, real human emotion, though only concerned with the paws of a cat and a razor, whereas Eva's taper fingers on the tiller of this remarkable craft seemed to want the solidarity of mortal experience. But it would never do to lose faith in Phoebe's inventions, for it was his faith in them that lent him his unique skill as an interpreter and chronicler of them. And anyhow, the razor blade was safely inaccessible now to any cat on its pleasure excursions, and he turned his mind back to the woods of Richmond. With the unexpectedness of a clock loudly chiming, his imagination began to work. What if he should suddenly die even as he sat there at the table? Phoebe alone knew where he kept his will, and he saw her, blind with tears, unlocking the drawer and groping with trembling hand among its contents. Suddenly she would start back with a cry of pain and withdraw her hand, on which the fast-flowing blood denoted that she had severed an artery or two, and would bleed to death in a few seconds, as it happened to a most obnoxious marquee in the tale kind hearts are more than coronets next moment he had unlocked the drawer and gingerly holding the dread instrument of phoebe's death between his finger and thumb looked wildly round for some secure asylum for the hateful thing long he stood there in hesitation then mounting a set of library steps deposited on top of the tall bookcase which held the complete file of all the newspapers in which their tales had appeared then he set to work again on eva who presently ran her ice boat ashore below the star and garter hotel but half the morning had already gone and he had scarcely yet made a beginning of the morning's work phoebe was unusually buoyant at lunchtime today but for once her cheerfulness failed in shedding sunshine on philip my dear i have got over such a difficult point she said do you remember how moses isaacson got algeron to sign the paper which acknowledged that he was not lord st austell's legitimate son yes said philip feverishly trying to recall the exact happening of those miserable events well all that was written in invisible ink and all he thought he signed was the lease of eagle's castle there and look here is the first dish of asparagus and how about the lease asked philip it was written in watercolor ink and of course moses isaacson washed it off afterwards capital said philip that does the trick there was silence for a minute or two as the novelist ate the fresh asparagus and then phoebe said tomorrow dear you will have to come and work with me in the drawing-room the maids must begin their spring cleaning and indeed it should have been done a month ago we will have lunch and dinner in the hall while they do this room and the day after they will do the drawing-room and i will do my work with you here Philip's fingers were stealing towards the last stick of asparagus, but at this they were suddenly arrested. Ah, spring cleaning, he said with assured cheerfulness. They just dust the books, I suppose, and sweep the floor. She laughed. She had Eva's celebrated laugh, which was like a peal of silver bells. Indeed, they do much more than that, she said. Every book is taken out and dusted. They move all the furniture and clean it all, back and front and top and bottom, but you won't know a thing about it except that our dear elizabethan dining-room will look so spick and span that elizabeth herself might have dinner in it some day we must do a historical novel you and i think what a setting we have here though the day was so deliciously warm it felt rather chilly in the evening or so philip thought and a fire was lit in the drawing-room phoebe had a slight headache and thus it was quite natural that she should go to bed early leaving her husband sitting up as soon as he had heard the door of her bedroom close he went softly to the dining-room and again mounting the library steps took down the razor blade from the cache which this morning had seemed so secure and went back with it into the drawing-room it would have been terrible if jane the housemaid who always sang at her work should to-morrow have suddenly interrupted her warblings with a wild scream as she dusted the top of the bookcase perhaps the razor blade would have embedded itself in her hand perhaps even more tragically her flapping duster would have flicked it into her smiling and songful face and have buried it deep in her eye or her open mouth but now this gruesome domestic tragedy had been averted by philip's indigenous perception of the chilliness of the evening and with a sigh of relief he dropped the fatal blade into the core of the fire he went softly up to bed feeling very tired after this emotional day now that his anxiety was allayed he would have liked to tell phoebe how silly he had been for never before had he had a secret from her but then one of phoebe's most sacred idols in life was her husband's stern masculine common sense that like algernon's 
was never the prey of foolish fears and unfounded tremors. He hated the idea of smashing up his cherished image of Phoebe's, and determined to keep his unaccountable failing to himself. Phoebe should never know. Besides, it would vex her very much to be told that her present to him had occasioned him such uneasiness. He fell asleep at once and woke to the grey dawn of the morning to the sound, as it were, of clashing cymbals of terror in his brain. The housemaid would clear up the fireplace in the drawing-room, and there among the ashes, like a snake in the grass, would be the keen tooth of the razor-blade. Perhaps already Philip was too late, and before he could get down a cry of pain would ring through the silent house, betokening that Jane's lifeblood was already spreading over the new Kittermaster carpet, and he sprang from his bed and with bare feet went hurriedly down to the drawing-room. Thank God he was in time, and a minute afterwards he was on his way up to bed again with the razor-blade still dusty with ashes, but as sharp as ever, in an envelope taken from Phoebe's table. Temporarily he put it between his mattresses, since it was still only half-past four, climbed back into bed, and vainly attempted to compose himself to sleep. Already he was behindhand with work that should have been done yesterday morning, and when today, with the envelope containing the blade in his breast pocket, he tried to make up for lost time, he only succeeded in losing more of it. There were other distractions as well, for owning to the spring cleaning in progress in the dining room, he sat with Phoebe in the drawing room, and she, quite recovered from her headache, and quite undisturbed by his presence, was reeling off sheet after sheet in her big, firm handwriting of the further trials that awaited Algernon. Sometimes she looked up at him with a bright, glam smile, born of the joy of creation. But for the most part her head was bent over her work, and but a short peal of silver bell laughter from time to time denoted the ecstasy of invention. And falling more and more behind her, Philip lumbered in her wake, with three-quarters of his mind entirely absorbed in the awful problem regarding the contents of the envelope in his breast pocket. Suddenly, brighter than the noonday sun outside, an idea illuminated him, and he got up. "'I shall take ten minutes' stroll, my dear,' he said. "'Solvator Ambulando, you know, and you have given me a difficult chapter to write.' She recalled herself with an effort to the real world. "'I think I won't come with you, darling,' she said. I am afraid of breaking the golden thread, as you once called it. Let me see. And she grabbed the golden thread again. At the bottom of the garden ran a swift chalk stream that had often figured in their joint warks. And towards this Philip joyfully hurried. He picked up half a dozen pebbles from the gravel path, put them into the envelope which contained the instrument of death, tucked the flap in, and threw it into the stream. There was a slight splash and he saw the white envelope shiningly sink through the water until it came to rest at the bottom. He returned to Phoebe with the sense that he had awoke from some strangling nightmare. For a couple of days after that, Philip enjoyed the ecstasy which succeeds the removal of some haunting terror, basking in the sunshine of security. He could look down on the dark clouds through which he had passed, and feel with thankfulness how completely, though narrowly, he had escaped the misty fringe of some trouble of the brain the claws and teeth and pincers of a fixed idea. The simple expedient of throwing the razor blade into the stream had entirely dispersed those clouds. Until then, he had never known the sweetness of sanity of the sun. Then, with tropical rapidity, the tempest closed in upon him again. He and Phoebe had driven out in their motor car one afternoon, and had dismissed it two miles from home in order to have the pleasure of walking back through the flowery lanes. Philip was something of a botanist, and since he was now engaged on the chronicling of the reunion of Eva and Algernon, which unexpectedly took place in a ruined temple near Rome, he wanted to refresh his memory by the sight of the glories of the early English summer, in order to deck the flowery fields in which the ruined temple lay with the utmost possible lavishness of floral tapestry. The ruin stands for the trial they have passed through, my dear, he explained to Phoebe, and lo, all around nature breaks into gladness. Phoebe gave a deep sigh. I think that's lovely, she said. How I embellish my dry skeleton of a tail, darling, covering it with strong muscles and lovely supple skin. We are happy, aren't we? I wonder if Algernon and Eva were really as happy, even at that moment, as we always are. They had come near the stream that flowed by the bottom of the garden, the bank of which was a tangle of flowers. Loose strife, meadow sweet, marsh marigold, willow herb, said Philip. Delicious names, are they not? The sound of shrill juvenile voices was heard, and turning a bend in the lane, they came opposite the pool where Philip had thrown the razor blade. 
there on the bank were half a dozen small boys in various degrees of nudity and rosy from their bathing little darling said phoebe sympathetically what a jolly time they have been having in the water willow herb marsh marigold murmured philip mechanically looking around for the traces of blood on the stream bank he took a firm hold of himself and managed to walk across the wooden bridge that led to the bottom of the garden with some show of steadiness but he almost reeled and fell when looking into the pool he saw the razor blade its encompassing envelope having been destroyed by the water shining on the pebbly bottom of the stream like tragic crying gold when they had had tea he made some lame excuse of steadying flowers a little longer and slipped down again into the stream the boys had gone and taking off his shoes and socks and rolling his trousers up to the knee he waded out over the sharp pebbles to where his doom flickered in the sunshine with the aid of his stick he propelled it into shallower waters and picked it up then shivering from the brisk water and tearing his socks as he pulled them over his wet feet he returned with it to the house in a state of more miserable dejection than algernon had ever been even when he sat down on the ruins of the roman temple unaware that eva was just about to come around the corner with april in her eyes for the next week philip carried the razor blade about with him in a stud box that during the day never left his pocket and at night reposed under his pillow he made several attempts to get rid of it in a way that commended itself to his conscience which seethed with scruples and imaginary terrors burying it once in the garden and at another time throwing it into the ash bin but the sight of his terrier digging into the potato patch for a suitable hiding place for his bone caused him to disinter it from the first of these and the second entailed a dismal midnight visit to the dustbin when one evening phoebe casually alluded to the dustman's approaching visit on another occasion he was fired with the notion of embedding it in the interstice of the rough bark of the ilex at the end of the garden well out of reach of curious fingers and with the stud box in his pocket climbed with infinite difficulty up into its lower branches but while wedging it into a suitable crevice the bough on which his weight rested suddenly gave way and he fell heavily to the ground while the blade flashed through the air like excalibur and plunged into a bramble bush it was of course necessary to get it out and this prickly business combined with a sprained ankle brought him almost aground in the shoals of despair he began contemplating enlisting as a private in the british army though well over the military age and of a beast figure perhaps he would find some opportunity in flanders of throwing it suitably weighted into a german trench only the thought of phoebe left alone and making up interminable plots with no one to turn them into narrative for her kept him from this desperate step meantime his work halted and languished for sleepless nights and nightmare days miserably affected his power of composition his style and even such matters as punctuation and spelling pete grew anxious about him and recommended a holiday but he had the wisdom to know that the only thing that kept him on the safe side of the frontier between sanity and madness was determined application to work however poor the output was he felt that he might just as well pack his boxes and go straight to bedlam instead of making a circuitous journey there via the malvern hills it was when his condition was at its worst that there gleamed a light through the tunnel of his despair the editor of the yorkshire telegraph who wanted another story by the partingtons with the shortest possible delay wrote to him suggesting in the most delicate manner that life in new york would present an admirable setting for the tale especially since the united states had come into the war and offering to pay his passage to the salubrious city if he would favorably consider this proposal and all at once philip remembered having read in some book of physical geography studied by him in happier boyish days that the atlantic in certain places was not less than seven miles deep he read this amiable epistle to his wife upon my word it sounds a very good plan he said brightly what do you say phoebe i will give me the holiday of which you think i stand in need phoebe shook her head do you propose that i should come with you she asked why should a holiday among the submarines do you more good than the malvern hills the thought of the deep holes in the atlantic grew ever more rosy to philip's mind even the hideous notion of being torpedoed failed to take the color out of it my dear these are days in which a man must not mind taking risks he said she smiled at him i know your fearless nature darling she said but what is the point of running unnecessary risks local color there is a great deal in mr Erthington's remarks i don't agree i should think with our experience we ought to be able to describe new york without going there 
we didn't find it necessary to go to Athens or Khartoum or Mexico. True, he said, but perhaps my descriptions might have gained in veracity if we had. That was a tiresome letter to the Yorkshire Telegraph about the spires on the Acropolis. If we had been there, we should have known that there weren't any. He fingered the stud box in his pocket for a moment, and his fingers itched to drop it over a ship's side. My part of our joint work might gain in true artistic feeling, he said, if I described what I had actually seen. Art holds the mirror up to nature, you know. Yes, darling, but do you think Shakespeare meant that art must hold the mirror up to New York? asked she. I fancy there is very little nature in New York. He took a turn or two up and down the room, while the box positively burned his fingertips. I can't help feeling as I do about it, he said. And Phoebe, one of our earliest vows to each other was that each of us should respect the other's literary conscience. She got up. You disarm me, my dear, she said. Apply for your passport, and if they give it to you, go. I only ask you to respect my feminine weakness and not make me come with you among all those horrid submarines. They sealed her compact with a kiss. By the time Phoebe had interviewed her cook, her husband had already written his letter applying for his passport on the grounds of artistic necessity in his profession. She read it through with high approval. Very dignified and proper, she said. By the way, dear, there will be no work for us this morning. We are going over to the factory for explosives with kind Captain Trail. You and I must observe the process very carefully, as we want all the information we can get for the hero of Ypres. He jumped up with something of his old alacrity. Aha! There speaks your artistic conscience, he said. And don't let me see too many soft glances between you and Captain Trail. Phoebe looked highly delighted and returned the compliment. And there are some very pretty girls working there, she observed slyly. An hour afterwards, they were padding in felt slippers round the room where bombs were packed with a fatal gray triacle, one spoonful of which was sufficient to blow them and the whole building into a million fragments. A new type of bomb was being made there consisting of a cast-iron shell fitted with the hole through which the gray triacle was poured. An iron stopper was then screwed into the hole. There were hundreds of those empty shells, which slide along grooved ways to where the triacle was put into them, and they then were pressed on to the girls, who fixed their stoppers. It was all soft, silent, deadly work, and Philip recorded a hundred impressions on his retentive memory. Phoebe and Captain Trail were walking just ahead of him, and suddenly when a great light broke, so vividly illuminating his brain that he almost thought some terrific explosion, seen and not heard, had occurred. Stealthily he drew from his pocket the stud case. Stealthily he opened it and took out the razor blade. Then, bending over an empty bomb case as if to examine it, he dropped the blade into it. It fell inside with a slight chink, which nobody noticed. A couple of minutes afterwards, the bomb case had passed through the hands of the dispenser of triacle, and had its stopper screwed in. And where are all those little surprise packets going? asked Philip airily. To aeroplanes on the west front, said Captain Trail. We're sending off a lot tonight. Perhaps that one. And he pointed to the identical bomb which Philip had had a hand in filling. We'll make a mess in Mannheim next week. I hope so, said Philip fervently. The only thing, now that Philip had disposed of the razor blade, that clouded his complete content was the fear that his passport would be granted him, and that he would have to make a journey to America. Happily, no such unnerving calamity occurred, for a week later he received a polite intimation from the passport office that the object for which he wanted to go there did not seem of sufficient importance to warrant the granting of a permit. So wreathed in smiles, he passed his letter over to Phoebe. There's the end of that, he said. Philistines! Barbarians! she said indignantly. I suppose they are acting in the best of their judgment, he said. I dare say they have never heard of me. My dear, don't be so cynical, said Phoebe. Well, well, certainly I am bitterly disappointed. He took up the morning paper. Bitterly, he said again. Hello, our airmen bombed Mannheim two nights ago and dropped three tons of high explosives. Well, that is very interesting. Captain Trail said that Perhaps some of those bombs which we saw being filled would make a mess in Mannheim. I hope they were those actual ones. So do I, said Phoebe. Was there much damage done? The German account says that there was hardly any, but of course that is the German account. A few people were wounded and cut by fragments of the bombs. Cut! He got up and could hardly refrain from dancing around the table among the rushes. Some deep cuts! 
I shouldn't wonder, he said. End of section 15. Recording by Roman Noble, romannoble.com.